So if you have a great brain, great idea, or if you have capital, you should come here because this is the hotspot where you want to be. You know, the people with the ideas we need to have been much stronger on you know venture capital and these things. But basically, we should be the place. And first, we can say, okay, if we can become the hotspot in Europe, number one, and then we'll play hard games against Silicon Valley. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but we're on par. We're on the same level. Make that a bit more open. Invite people to reuse the, the science that we create and reuse all of the patents and everything. For instance, if we took just a small fraction of the money we invested in medicine from the government, from the region and everything, and made people open up and say that this is for reuse for everyone, and not try to make that patented for one single company when we already paid for it. Peter Sunde, who is actually the first man in history who has twittered from a trial, he has also managed to do what the record industry and the film industry haven't managed to do so far, to create a web service which allows creators and artists to get paid without having any dirty hands in between taking all the money. And this enormous creative mind of Carl, we will now get a presentation from. So this is a great opportunity, and let's welcome with a big hand, Carl McFaul. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here on the Innovation in Mind conference at the Lund University. How does it come that uh, San Francisco Bay Area has been able to produce a greater economic value from its scientific capacity compared to the science hubs in Europe? They have managed to create new value streams through the use of open source, open innovation, and open space technology as an alternative to the more traditional sequential and centralized model. So when I was really young, uh, I started with computers. I was maybe 9, 10 or something. Uh, I copied everything in order to actually use the computer. There was no open source or anything like that. You couldn't access the internet and download things. You just copied games and software and everything you used your computer for from your friends. Uh, and we never discussed if that's good or bad. We just did it because it was essentially the way we learned. So our technology for sharing knowledge has evolved from orality to uh, handwritten manuscripts onto the invention of the printing press and into the domain of electronic devices like computers along with the development of the World Wide Web. Now, in the 15th and 16th century, restrictions began to appear in the form of copyright laws spreading around Europe. And these copyright laws were enforced by the church and the governments in order to regulate and control printing and spreading of information. Now, in the 19th century, these copyright laws were expanded to include even thinking itself. I will call from now on this kind of authoritative bureaucracy as the conservative foot. And we will see how this guy interferes with cultural evolution and the room for innovation. Then the industry decided that let's make up this thing called CD. And the big thing with the CD was that it was read-only, so you couldn't write your own CD in the beginning. And the industry was really pushing for this because it was better for them and they got more control. Now look at this beautiful score. It took several hundred years to develop this art of polyphonic music from the early days of just playing monophony. They didn't calculate for clever programmers and mathematicians that would make it possible to compress all of these really large CDs into small MP3 files. The authorities of the Catholic Church proposed to ban polyphonic music. They thought the composers had gone way too far in their exploration of uh, musical innovation. With this digitalization as well as the decentralization of the internet, for the first time in the world you have a, a democratized music environment. But one shouldn't underestimate the tactical minds of creative composers. The most prominent composer of this time, Giovanni Perluigi da Palestrina, created a simple declamatory style that on hearing convinced the cardinals that polyphonic music could be intelligible and uh, that such music was too beautiful to be banned. No, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the sea. Why couldn't we do that? Well, it's one, one small problem. There wasn't a royal navy. The whole foundation of harmony and uh, melodic patterns in the Western music was set and is now being reused and copyrighted in the modern pop music. So the noble people, after lots of discussion, trying to change the Queen's mind, but they couldn't. They came up with this concept, that they were actually prepared to pay for it in gold, but not with their blood. So that created the pirates. There is over 100,000 computers every second connecting to Pirate Bay to ask for files. 
We've always been talking about this as some sort of revolution. But the big thing that I want you to remember is that there is not a revolution in the music industry or technology, because the revolution is one or two or three people or a small group of people that decide that this is something totally new, we want to revolt and we want to do something totally different. We never did that. We, it's basically evolution, because this is something with technology and all of the advances, we see small steps all the time. So there's nothing new, it's just, you know, we need to see it in a bigger context. Pretty interesting stuff. So the crisis and lots of new ideas, the very smart queen created this new incentive, giving the modern pirate a power of attorney so that they could go around the world. And the torrent itself is very big. It's about 80% in some studies of the whole internet, which means that Pirate Bay users are using half of all the physical cables in the, of the internet of the world. But also, what they have created was the modern company the limited risk company, the reward and you know, blood and gold, how you share these things. This was actually the foundation that could lead to the, how you financed all of the innovations that happened in the later industrial revolutions. Uh, he tripped over a cable once in the, our uh, server data center, and Pirate Bay was down for three uh, or four days, and you can see the traffic of the internet just decline. And of course, the greatest big project that they would come up with after fighting the Spanish was to create the companies, the great East Indian companies. And these were the most successful companies in the history of economics ever. The second most profitable company in the history ever, of course, is Cisco. By becoming this big, of course, you get some enemies. And Hollywood became really upset. So they went over to the White House and said, we have a problem in Sweden, you need to take action. And invited the Swedish Minister of Justice, Thomas Bodström, and uh, all of his friends to come over and talk about this issue and said that if you don't take down the Pirate Bay, we're going to put you on the same trade sanction list as Cuba. And we're not going to buy Volvos, we're not going to buy anything from you anymore until you get this problem solved. And this is, of course, illegal in Sweden. A minister cannot tell the police what to actually do, only in general terms. But anyhow, they did a big raid in 2006, took all of our machines and 200 others that had nothing to do with Pirate Bay, because they didn't understand what the Pirate Bay was. Um, and, uh, Two or three days after, we, there was someone took this photo outside of the government building, Riksdagen, in, in Stockholm. Where essentially, you could see that there was a generational shift, that we wanted you know, our service back, and then you know, we were threatening people to take the fax machines if they didn't do that. So Peter has been part of a team, knowing the people that created one of the greatest websites on the planet, that you know, at you know, some kind of level supports maybe up to uh, half of the internet traffic. How many times do you think that he has been invited to lecture about these really important learnings at LTH? I go around speaking about the internet and censorship and all of these issues quite, to a, quite a lot of places. Uh, I was in Brazil two years ago and I met with President Lula, who, the old president of Brazil, who gave me a big hug and said, Peter, there's no extradition treaty between Brazil and Sweden, you can always come here. <laughs> can Lund develop to Silicon Valley? And this is, of course, completely silly, because Lund, in many aspects, are already better than Silicon Valley. Okay, what is it? Silicon Valley and the US is suffering terribly, and they're calling the phenomenon themselves shield innovation. Innovation is not as fast, and it's not as hot, and it's not as interesting as it used to be, even with the super com companies like Google, because the lobby has become too strong. You've heard from Carl, you've heard from Peter, you've heard a few examples from myself. Important technologies that always the old people, you know, the people with the sailboats, try to stop people from, you know, steamboats. They always try to do that. Peer-to-peer, -peer, which is a core technology in the computer science space field, is basically try to make illegal. What has happened is that in Silicon Valley, no venture capital is wanting to invest in peer-to-peer -peer technology because it's not opportune. What if we could do this more in London? What if we could become the place where you can work with these things, like stem cells, like peer-to-peer -peer technology, creating the new legal framework, as Peter tried to do himself, creating things like Flatter, creating the new ecosystem, creating the solutions. If we could be the place with the best people in the world, the best brands in the world, I cannot be in Silicon Valley because I'm interested in peer-to-peer -peer or I'm interested in stem cells. Just as an example, we could get a really interesting competitive edge and we could have best-in-class people because we just don't try to fight the innovation. 
We try to embrace it, we try to find new solutions. Of course there are kinks with new technologies, that has always been. But if we can be that place that stands up for these basic rights to do you know, novel thinking and then also trying to find the right ecosystem around them, I think that could be really, really cool.